Awesome. As I introduce my speaker, Satya, uh, he's somebody who has really inspired me because with 19 years experience, he has never stopped learning. If I, if I just count the number of certifications he did, the kind of learnings he has done, just profound. Um, he is into technology, right? He is uh, actually Cap Germany certified senior architecture. He's a program manager, program director. In fact, he has multi you know, prof portfolios he's managing. He has done his TOB, TOGAF certification, Java certification, AWS certification. Um, he, he has been amazing in learning. To top all of it, he's currently actually a PhD candidate who is doing master's in management and working technology into it. So uh, always a pleasure listening to Satya and Satya over to you and uh, eagerly waiting to learn more from this session. Thank you, Shakti, for that generous introduction. <laughs> all right, uh, let's move along to our journey. Uh, when I started thinking about this topic, right? How do we combine agile and architecture? And like Shakti mentioned, I started my career as an architect and sitting on top as an enterprise architect, I could see a lot of things going on in the ground, some good, some bad. So that gave me a very unique perspective into how architecture really works in this agile world. So when I started thinking about a topic to present, I was initially thinking, why not call it agile architecture? But then I realized, realized it's not exactly agile, it's more of lean. So I thought, let me introduce the concepts. What is agile? What is architecture? What is lean? And then we'll see how they tie together. So I'll give you the concepts. We'll talk about a few of the myths that are in the market in the industry and see how these myths can be busted. Let's start with the definition of agile, which talks about the fundamental organization of a system within the components and how they react. So every company, every application, every solution has got multiple components. And the way they talk to each other, the way they interact with each other, the way they communicate with each other is what forms the architecture. So if I take a simple example of a car, the car has got wheels that is connected to the axle, that is connected to the engine, right? And then that's connected to multiple other features. Now, all of this come together for us to be able to drive the car and for the car to move forward. If this does not work in a seamless way, there will be troubles and that's where problems start coming. So that's how you look at architecture. But when I look at Agile, Agile talks about the ability to move quickly and easily. Uh, Agile talks about moving fast. Agile talks about making changes in a very fast paced environment. So on one hand, we have architecture that talks about integrating multiple components. On the other hand, we have Agile that talks about how do I react quickly and how do I make changes quickly. And then comes a third concept called Lean or Lean Manufacturing, which is primarily created or you know, administered by Toyota in their Toyota production systems. It's basically a method aimed primarily at reducing the time within the production systems. So if it takes certain amount of time from going from point A to point B, how do I reduce this? Right. So if I understand these three definitions, Agile, Architecture, and Lean, it may seem that they're not looking in the same direction. One may be looking north, other may be looking south. Uh, if I summarize, Agile is about doing it. Lean is about thinking and then continuously doing it. So they are really not that different, though it may seem on the top that they are not talking in the same language. So let's see what the role of an architect is. And that's a million dollar question that I get asked a lot, uh, not just by you know, senior people, but also by 10 year old kids. What do you do? What does an architect do? Let me take two analogies to explain this concept here. This is a building, a multi-storied, multi-tiered building. Uh, Kate here knows how to architect such buildings, right? What if I don't call an architect? What if I don't employ an architect, but I decide to build this building on my own? I hired the masons, I hired the glassman, I built the building on my own. I may be able to create a building the way you see in this picture, but there is no guarantee that the building will survive the time, right? Maybe another 10 years down the line, it will collapse. Or maybe while building the building on the third floor, the entire thing will collapse. Why? Because I did not plan for it. If I did not plan for it, I have no assurances that this thing will last, this thing will do what it is intending to do. It is not feasible. 
So for me to ensure that my building is long lasting, it does what it is supposed to do, I need an architect. The architect that we're talking about here is not an IT architect, but an architect who designs building, right? Uh, the concept in IT remains the same. When you are building a software, what is the guarantee that the software will work? What is the guarantee that the software will be able to take the load or it will take the additional load that might come on it? That is where an architect comes in so that he or she ensures the software is feature-proof, the software can make sure whatever it is supposed to do, and it is aligned with the business definition. Another analogy I would like to take here is an elevator. If you look at an elevator, there are multiple floors in the building. An elevator helps connect these floors. To take the analogy into an IT side or a business side, there is a floor in the building where all business folks are sitting. There's a floor in the building where IT folks are sitting. There's a floor in the building where the security and the infrastructure team is sitting. Now, typically these floors in an industry operate in silos. They do not talk to each other. They just look at their own KPIs and plan for delivering what is expected of them. End of the day, I have to run a business, not run the silos. So how do I get these guys to talk together? How do I get these guys to work in accordance with my value and my long-term direction of my company? And this elevator is where the architect, the architect fits in. The architect is the elevator that talks to all these floors and make sure they are in alignment. And they are aligning the outcome towards the company's values and principles and not just their own keys. So that is typically what an architect does. And uh, just to give a context, the architect we are referring to and we'll be referring to going forward is an architect in an IT industry so that uh, you, know, you know there is no confusion on this. So, so that is the analogy I wanted to put to simplify what an architect typically does. Not just plan for the future, not just build a robust software, but also ensure that he or she is connecting the dots across various silos in the networks. Uh, now, architects can be of multiple types. Uh, first one being an enterprise architect, somebody who is sitting up top uh, looking at the overall company strategy and ensuring that they're aligning the outcome with the business value that the company wants to deliver. Solution architects are smaller entities under the enterprise architect who work in smaller accounts or projects or line of businesses. They are also categorized into multiple varieties where they specialize in one of the fields, like an application architect or an information architect or a security. The application architect would focus on how do I build the software? The information architect will focus on the backend databases and other structures. Security, infra, I think they are self explanatory So these architects have got speciality and they build their components to make sure the larger enterprise gets the solution or software that they want to get. The third kind of architect that we typically see is what we call a business architect. Uh, somebody who understands the business well, who understands the strategy of the corporate well, and then aligns a roadmap which the company can undertake to reach the outcome. Now, these are the three architects that are typically av available in an industry. And these guys work hand in hand to make sure they're aligning the overall company towards the goal of the mission. Uh, sorry, moving along, let's look at the objectives. Why do we have architects? And what is the objective of architects? I gave you a very simple example in terms of building buildings and elevators, but let's look at the technical nuances. Uh, the first one uh, is to drive innovation and change. Now, our customers do not know what they want. It is our job to give them what they want. It is our job to find out what suits their need, build it based on the relevance, and make sure that we are credible enough to supply good quality services to our customers. So we drive innovation, we drive a change, and make sure our company is focused towards it. Uh, if I take a simple example, uh, Steve Jobs came up with an iPhone. Now that's an innovation. Before iPhone, if you would have gone to any customer and said, what kind of phone would you want? They will talk about a phone that has got nine or 10 buttons. Nobody could think of a phone that has touch screen. So that's how the architects are driving innovation and bringing a change that materially impacts the customers. The second set of things has to own the solution. Yes, we have got a vision. The vision has got multiple steps that needs to be taken to reach the outcome. These smaller steps are what we call solutions and multiple solutions come together to deliver what we call the vision. 
going back to my iPhone example, there is a screen on an iPhone, there's a software on an iPhone, there's got hard drive on it, there is a camera on it, right? All these multiple solutions have to be built separately with utmost quality, integrated together, and then final product has to be reached. So an architect, typically an application architect, would own the solutions and make sure it is managed in a way there are no risks for delivery. And the third one is to delivery or own the delivery. Now, this is where uh, a lot of the architects typically don't take ownership. It's not their ownership to deliver the work. If there is a program manager or a product owner, whatever you call it, right, in your companies, who take care of it. But the architect also has a shared KPI when it comes to it. They have to ensure they're working with the delivery needs to steward the journey of final, whatever you want to call it, right? Is it a solution? Is it a product? Is it something which is a value for the customer? The key point here is the value is never smooth. There's always an up and down, right? And this up and down has to be managed by the product manager or program manager, along with what we typically call an architect who manages the technical side of the house. So these are the three key things that an IT architect typically owns and helps deliver in terms of KPIs. Uh, moving along, let's look at the role of an architect. Again, we've discussed on this, but more from a technical perspective. What are the real roles? The first one is to reduce cost and increase revenues. Now, when you build a solution, it can have two outcomes. Either it becomes a cost, it, it becomes a solution that helps me gain more customers, thereby increasing my revenue, or it becomes a solution that makes me operationally more effective, thereby reducing my cost. The increasing revenue part is outward facing, the operational cost is inward facing, but that's what is supposed to be built by an uh, The next point is about the framework which builds the essence of a system. Now, obviously a system has got multiple components, multiple areas where it is impacting, but there is always a backbone which is helping the system decide. A human being can do a lot of things, but without the backbone, nothing can be done. In the same way, the framework or the backbone of the system is what is the essence, and that is built by the architect. They have to read the design because design is the core foundation, and the design should be responsive to change. Now, change is the name of the game, right? In the industry, everything is changing. They're changing at a pace that you know, the, the typical systems are unable to abide by. How do we create a design that is foolproof and make sure that the changes are are uh, basically incorporated easily without a lot of changes, a lot of issues. Uh, next point is about documentation. Uh, those who are into Agile will argue with this point, but there is always a necessary documentation. When I'm building a solution, when I'm building a software, there's always an end user who is working on it. And the end user needs to understand how to work on the solution, how to deliver the solution. That is where the documentation, which is at most unnecessary, has to be generated and the architect plays a very key role in it. And finally, I can do a lot of things, but how usable is my design? Uh, again, I, I'll again take the same example of iPhone that I was saying, the phone prior to the, prior to the iPhones were usable. We could make calls, we could take pictures, we could do whatever we wanted to do, right? But the usability of an iPhone far exceeded those designs. So how do you look at the future? And how do you design based on the core foundation of usability, making the life of the customers easier and better? So that's what a typical architect does. Let's start combining the two roles, architect and agile. Uh, if you look at it, there are a there are few things that are in the industry, which are, uh, in my view, little myth, little truth. Uh, we call architecture as a heavyweight architecture. Yes, it is a heavyweight activity because we do a lot of thinking for the future. We do a lot of planning for the future and we build the pace on which a software is built or a system is built. But do we really need to do upfront design? Or Agile, does, does it stop us from doing upfront design? These are the two questions which I would put in your mind. Uh, you don't have to answer it, but let's go through the rest of the slides and hopefully you will know the answer to this. How many of you have heard of the Agile Manifest, right? Uh, anybody in IT, anybody working in a Fortune 500, or any company for that matter, 
I'm sure have seen Agile being implemented and Agile Manifesto is the core belief or the core principle behind what we tell you. This is the beautiful picture that you can see on the website agilemanifesto.org. It lays down the basic principles of Agile software development. When this was written, there were a lot of questions that came in the mind of people. Is it really going to help me in my architecture beliefs or is it going to be contradicting with my architecture beliefs? And why does this question come in? First point, it says, we prefer working software over comprehensive documentation. This can very well be misrepresented in two ways. People might say, I don't need any more documentation because Agile says working software over documentation. People can also read it as no more design. Since there is no need of documentation, why do I design? I simply go ahead and build my working software, right? This is again a big question. A lot of people have different viewpoints, different thoughts. Some are right, some are wrong. We'll see how the answers are. But at this point, I think this line is what confused a lot of people to think agile and architecture are different. They are not coordinated. They are not going in the same direction. The last point, responding to change over following a plan. Agile encourages us to be open to change, right? It tells us that responding to the change has higher precedence over following the plan. Now, is it saying that we don't need a plan? No more planning? Maybe, may not be, right? So when this manifesto came in, the idea was to help the developers deliver software better, faster, quicker, and with better quality. But these two lines somehow were read as contradictory to Agile. People could not really match this with the core principles of Agile and go together. So that's that's the time when there was a divide between what architecture is and what agile is. And typically these two groups would work in opposite directions. That's that's how the industry has been shaping up or had been shaping up. Uh, moving along, let's look at the traditional things, how it used to work, and then see how it can change with the agile risk. In traditional ways, we used to embrace engineering too strongly and too early. Uh, we would start a project, we'll build the architecture for the entire project. The project may take a year or two to complete, but the architecture for that project is built in the early phases, and that is followed throughout the life cycle. Because of this large changes that happens in the beginning, traditional architecture is fearful of large changes. So they do not want to make changes the, moment, the moment the project has initiated. So obviously, to make sure that you are not making a lot of change, and we are going to reuse the code the way it was planned, we are going to force or rush into the implementation, which obviously causes a lot of gaps. And because of that, we end up creating a lot of innovation. Right? This is where the problems start coming in. And to make sure that the problems are not persisted and people are learning from the previous, previous mistakes, a lot of focus started to be put on the methods, the rules, right? the formal processes, uh, those who have done PMP, I'm sure will align with this slide. There are a lot of steps and processes that were built to make sure the problems are aligned and we are learning from our mistakes. But because of that, we had to put a lot of planning. Because of the focus and long-term results, the planning was really valued. Planning was really poor. And that is where the differences started coming in with how Agile wanted to implement. So with that thought, I'm sure there will be questions in your mind. Agile says something, architecture says something, are they same, are they different? Well, they are not same. They are, they are two parts, right? One helps each other or complements each other. We'll now go and see how to do architecture in the lean ways. Before I go into that, I want to introduce a concept to you that is called <coughs> value streams. By definition, value streams are a set of actions that take place to add value to a customer from the initial request to the final value that is given to the customer. In simple words, value streams are something that can give revenue to companies, right? If I go to a bank to open an account, I have to have certain steps to be followed. I have to submit a form, I have to give in my documentations, there is a KYC process that happens, and then my account gets created. So from the moment I step into the bank to the moment my account gets created, that is a value stream. If I want a loan, I have to go to the website of the bank and check what is my eligibility. I have to apply for a quote. 
there is some background check that would be done. And then maybe a loan would be given with certain dates. The moment the loan is dispersed and I start paying back my EMIs, that's the end of the registry. Right? So end-to-end -end process that can help map the process from trigger to value. Trigger is what started the process and value is what is given to the customer, the end users of the process is what we call a value stream. Just wanted to give this concept because that is what we use on the going forward basis. So let's look at some of the key principles that needs to change when we get into a lean architecture. The first principle that we should follow in an agile way is to architect products, not just solutions for products. What is a product? A product has three key views. One is the end user, one is the technology, and one is the business. Uh, if I take an example here, uh, any product that you use on a daily basis is a, is a product that has to be built. Let's take Google Chrome out here. Now, Google Chrome was built way back in 2005 or six. It is still there. We have version, I think, 104 or 105 right now. We use Google Chrome to browse the internet. So what has Google built? Google has built a product. They do not have projects coming in and updating Chrome. They have a dedicated team of people who are working on the product called Chrome, understand what the business wants, which is us as the end user, understand the users, sorry, the users are the end users like us. The business is what Google wants, right? What kind of revenue model they want to put on Chrome? How do they want to make money and all of that? And the technology behind it. A combination of these three factors helps the team continue to enhance Chrome for your end users. And that is how we should be building projects, the products, not projects. Now, typically, what do we do? We build a project, the project implements, and the team disperses. They go to individual areas, they join some other projects. So one, the application knowledge gets lost, and the technology also gets lost. So to make sure that it does not repeat, we always encourage to build a product. And with the product in mind, we start enhancing the product as we move on. It's like those old cartoons we had, right? Tom and Jerry kind of thing, where uh, they would roll a small ball from the top of a snow, snowy mountain. And as the ball comes down, it will accumulate snow and it will grow bigger. Same concept has to be applied when we are delivering an application. The next point is about focusing on the quality attributes, not on the functional requirements. Now, this is where a core concept comes in. What extent does an architect play in the overall process? There is functional attribute which talks about what is the application, how many screens, what functionality that is, does it do? That necessarily is not the role of an architect. The focus of an architect is around the, the non-functional requirements or in, in typical terms, you can say the ETs. To look at it, interoperability, configurability, extensibility, mostly there's ETs, right? Typically, these are the ones that determine what are the various things that this application does or does not do. Interoperability, can I move this application from one location to another? Configurability, can I launch a new product in my application without making code changes? Robustness, can this application support 100,000 users concurrently logging in and trying something? Portability, moving from applications in Android to iOS or vice versa. The performance, how fast should it respond? These are core feeds that the architecture works on. So even though the focus of architect is not on the functionality, the outcome of functionality feeds into this. Now, if business says, an example to just justify this, when business comes to you and says, I have users who are logging in from Australia, India, and the United States. That is an input for you to decide how you want to do your performance, right? If you keep your servers in Australia, it will be awesome speed for the Australian customers. But the Indian customers will be slow. The American customers on the East Coast will be slower. Right? Now that your business has told you that your people are going to log in from three different geographies, you might want to copy the data and keep it in all three locations so that everybody refers to the nearest uh, server or the nearest edge node and gets it faster. So functional requirements feed into your non-functional requirements. As an architect, you don't need to worry about the functional requirement. You may question whether it is really required, but the requirements come from business. And that feeds as an input for you to build your non-functional requirement or your 
quality attributes. Well, another great point, uh, delay, delay the design decisions until absolutely necessary. Now, this is what is really, really important because if you do not do that, if you start making decisions in advance, you will not be able to take decisions based on the complete viewpoint. If you look at a war, right, when a war is going on, the generals would always try to look at the war from the top, right, to see what is going on and then make decisions. A soldier, soldier who is, war, is fighting in the war, who is sitting in the or standing in the war field, he or she does not have that viewpoint. So when you are sitting on top and you're looking at the overall picture, you will be able, you will have to decide and you have to make changes as things move along. So if you make decisions in the beginning and you commit to those decisions like you did in the traditional architecture, it makes it difficult for you to change. So if you deploy all your army and then you realize that the war is, is not going as you planned, it becomes difficult for you to pull back and make changes. So do minimum stack see whether it is going your progress and keep adding more and more, right? That's the typical way of doing decision making in terms of design. Uh, the next point is about architecting for change, which ensures we are enabling interoperability. Uh, this is basically what we simply call the architecture of, uh, you know, uh, loose coupling, right? API-based architecture. I can easily replace a component, put something else instead and things work out. Started with the, the multi tiered architecture that we have, where we have a screen layer, we have a database layer, where I can remove something and then take it along. That has come a long way. If you look at the current world, Netflix is such strong and such uh, poor and robust architected application. They had to actually create applications to cause problems so that they can test the contingencies. Right? So basically, break the system down and do an orchestration on top so that it can be done. The one of the critical points which involves architects and businesses is to model the organization around the system. Now, when you go and talk to people, everybody will say, my problem is different. I want a different solution. But mind you, your problem cannot be different. If I have four banks standing in front of me, all of them do the same job, right? All of them give you services of loan. All of them give you services of credit cards and all of those things. Somebody is little more mature. Somebody is little more technologically advanced. Somebody has got better business processes. But end of the day, it's a bank. So if there is a system that is designed, let's build up the process around the system. And this plays a very key part when you are designing applications around packet solutions. So let's say you're using Salesforce or SAP. A lot of the time when you build Salesforce or buy Salesforce, business would say, you know what? Customize Salesforce to do this or customize SAP to do this. Well, if you are doing that customization, why the hell are you buying Salesforce? Maybe do it yourself in Java. It's cheaper. Salesforce already has got a lot of things built in. See how you can align your business to that system. That is how you can model the automation to run faster and faster. The last point is to around trade-offs. We always have trade-offs. There will be regulatory requirements. There will be issues in terms of competition, launching new things. How do you manage them and how do you make sure your application is robust enough to do this? So basically, when you are building architecture, do just enough architecture for the, the thing to go on. And as the thing reaches the end, build more. Right? So it's like putting more and more steps as the train moves forwards. Uh, one of the last point is around deploy. So we are building and testing for continuous deploy. In the past, and again, this is how Agile happens in a lot of projects. I'm sure you can put it to it. We get our requirements. We do our iterations where we create the work. And then we consolidate the work of multiple iterations together to do our integration, QA, and deploy. Many people call it the last mile. I'm sure many of you who are in the IT industry can correlate to that. Well, this is more of a scrum waterfall, water scrum fall, whatever you call it, right? You are doing waterfall, but you are trying to deliver and develop in scrum model. That is not how it should be. Instead, can we have iterations? And within the iteration, we do our QA and we do our release. The key point here is deploying and release. And there is a very thin line between the two. 
I can deploy to a pre-production environment, but I need not release it to my customers. Take an example of a beta release, right? And I've got Microsoft Office where you get beta releases. Now the beta version of the code is deployed by the development team, but it is not released to us as the end customers. Only a select few who have agreed to do the beta testing for them can get it tested and get back. So the, the intent here is not to go horizontal, but to go vertical. And at the end of each slice, we produce value that is deliverable to our customers. So to achieve this, we should always have a very key uh, application landscape that is differentiating between deployment and so these are the seven key principles of the lean architecture. Let me move into another concept of how do you look at architecture and how do you look at the system. When you approach a problem and try to find a solution, you need to look at it differently. You need to look at it in two ways. What is the system and what does it do? There is a system that is out there and you will see more often than not, we are not going to build systems from scratch. There is always certain systems which are available. We always enhance or build on top of it. So what is available and what does it do? What is available talks about the various classes, objects, the databases, the architects, right? whatever is available in the system right now. Before getting into any kind of future, the first thing you need to learn and understand is what does my system do right now? Then comes the part, what does it do? This talks about the various users who work on, the various interfaces or integrations that it has, regulated requirements, the designers who are working on it, right? So there is a set of software and there are a set of people who are working on it. You need to understand this first before you get into the concept of understanding the objects. Now, what are the objects? Objects are nothing but requirements or changes that are required to be done for you to deliver this to your device. So you have something and you want to be something or you want to do something. That gap is what comes up here. So what is my users thinking? What is my class? What is my object? What are my experts? And what is my desired? That is one gap that you have to find and note down the key. The second set of gap is on what the system does. When you talk about what the system is, and then you map it to the various scenarios. What are the various scenarios that might happen? Who are my end users? What are the users doing on my application? Once you have found the gaps on both sides, that is, what is my system, where I am and where I should be, what my system does today and what it should be. This is a very ideal start for you to understand what you are, what you should be, and the should be part should be done by the architect. Should be part should be fulfilled by what an architect does. So this is a concept that you need to apply whenever you get into any client or start working on any project. Otherwise, you end up going into the traditional way where you always look at, oh, this is what I have to build. Well, that's not as easy. We have to first understand the two nuances of the system, what it is and what it does, find the gap, and then see how best we can reach the gap. Moving along to safe. Now, what we have talked till now is concepts, constructs, right? In reality, it becomes difficult for end users to adapt all of it and then do it in the real life. Therein comes the scaling frameworks, safe being one of the most widely used frameworks. Now, let's look at the various constructs that safe has created in accordance with what we just talked about for the last 30 minutes and how it helps you implement architecture in that job. The first one is what SAFE calls an architecture runway. Uh, those who have worked in Agile and Scrum for a long time would know this concept called Sprint Zero, where you start in the beginning, before the start of the project. You do the entire architecture for that program in one go, and we call it Sprint Zero. Well, it's fine, it used to work, but it always you know, enforces the things that we talked about. You do not know the future, but you are building allocation and capacity as well as architecture for That is where SAFE recommends the use of what I have been talking about as just-in-time architecture. So if you are walking four steps, build architecture for five steps. And the moment the four steps are complete, do another four or five steps architecture. 
So runway is nothing but the set of existing things that you have and the ones that needs enhancement for you to support the feature. Uh, simple example, let's say I am I'm currently working out where my users are my, uh, let's say my internet users. Right? For example, I'm an insurance company. I do not sell it to the end customers. I have my agents who do it for me. Tomorrow, I want to extend it to my users. So you and I can log in. I can buy insurance directly without the intervention of an agent. Now, for me to do that, there are a lot of things I need to first do before I can expose this feature. First one being security. How do I ensure that the guys who are logging in from outside environment are logging in secure? How do I validate that these users have the right set of authentication and authority to do so? So before the development team can build a feature, a UI, or whatever credit cards and all of those things, I need to have support for security and authentication for these users. And that is what is part of my architecture and that. So the idea here is not to look a lot ahead in the future, but plan in advance so that we have basic set of data to execute the features. And as we move along, we enhance our runway to deliver the work that is supposed to be delivered for our clients. Moving along, runway is a collaborative effort. It's not a thing that is built in stone. It is a collaboration between the development team, the team that is delivering the software, and the business owners and the product owners who want the features to be delivered for them. It involves two key aspects, emergent design and intentional architecture. There are certain things that has to be done. For example, should I be doing it in Java or should I be doing it in .NET? That is not something that I can you know, leave for my developer to do this. That is something that I have to decide based on technology, based on scope, based on cost, based on multiple other things. But once the intentional architecture has been built, I will create a design that is emerging with time, that is emerging as and when my development team delivers students. So the design grows over time and becomes fruitful and provides the outcome and value that it is supposed to deliver. So there is always a tussle between the two. How much of it should be intentional and how much should be emergent? The tussle is always there. And that is where an architect takes a call of how much he puts he or she puts in the intentional part and how much he or she lets the team decides in terms of emergent. Um, to take an acronym and explain this, if you look at the malls, there are small play areas within malls where kids can go and play. Uh, you will see a boundary around the play area and within the boundary, there will be multiple things that the kids can play with. You would never see a parent go into the play area and guide the kids to play this or that. So there is this boundary where the parents are sitting outside and the kid is free to do whatever they want to do within that field. Think of the boundary as your intentional approach, right? The limit in which the team can play with. Right? And the kid has got this idea of emergent design. They can go and pick up any game within that boundary and play it the way he or she wants to. So that is something which is required and it requires the experience and expertise of an architect to do a right balance between the two. So, like I said, runway is not a straight line. It is a collaboration between the development team, the feature teams who are delivering new features, and the technology team who are giving the base features or base enablers, if you call it, for the feature teams to deliver it. So, to my example that I just told, the feature team wants to deliver a concept of selling to the third party customers. The technical team has to first make sure the authentication and security and other things are done before that feature can be exposed to the end customer. As you can see, this is going up, which means we are building more and more. But then the question comes in, why is the runway coming down? Right? Are we deleting code? Are we doing something which is not equal? Well, yes, absolutely. As we deliver better features, one of the key things that we always fail in the IT industry is to sunset the older features. In many a times you will see, we have delivered new features and the old features still reside in harmony, if you call it, and you end up spending double the money. So when you are building new features, it has to be very clear that you are also going to be sunsetting the features that these are going to replace. So runway is not a straight line, it goes up and down. We add new features, we add new enablers to our customers, and we sunset the ones which are obsolete and off, no use it. And this all is facilitated by the concept that SAFE talks about called Agile, means train or ART. Now, this is a very powerful concept. We call it 
continuous exploration, CE, continuous integration, CI, continuous deployment, CD, and finally, release on demand. If you look back at the value stream concept that I explained a few minutes back, what is my trigger? Why should I be making a change? Well, I'm making a change because either my competition has built something new or my customer demand has changed or there is a new technology available in the market. And that is all that is found out through my continuous exploration. So there is a set of people who are looking at the market, understanding the triggers that the company is facing and then deciding what they want to deliver. That goes as an input to my CI phase, continuous integration, where the team builds it, codes it, and tests it. The same thing goes for deployment. Like I said, deployment means putting in an environment which is close to production, where you can try out multiple things. And then when the customer is ready and you are ready as business, you release it to your end users. So this is the flow that we talk about within ERT. And this flow is validated and supported by what we call a continuous delivery pipeline. When we say DevOps, that is exactly what we're talking about. Set of features, a set of tools that can help uh, go from the point of exploration to integration to deployment and then to release automatically. To understand how we are and how we are doing in this journey, there is something that SAFE introduces called the DevOps Belfedar. It talks about the various steps that you see out here under the CE, CI, CD, and Amazon. Each of these uh, quadrants have got four steps. Uh, again, I'm not going to go deep into it, but just to give an idea of what they are. Each quadrant has got four steps, and once done successfully, you are able to complete that particular step. So for me to continuously explore, I need to have hypothesis of what my requirements are. I need to collaborate with a lot of other stakeholders and do some research. I need to first architect the solution and then synthesize the output. So these are the various steps for CE. Similarly, there are multiple steps for CI, CD, and release on demand. Uh, you can very well go to scaledagileframeworkcom and go through the details. The concept here is, when you look at it, it might look like a waterfall, what we did in the past. Well, it is, right? It is. The idea here is, for, for me to go from continuous exploration, which is step one, hypothesize, all the way up to deploy and learn as fast as possible. If you look at natural companies in terms of DevOps, they brag about going from an idea to deployment and release within 24 hours. That is what has to be achieved for us to achieve what we're calling about as architecture. So that's what I wanted to talk to you about. Uh, I have a few scenarios, real world scenarios that I have seen in my experience. I will show them and maybe I'll request you to say how you should approach this topic. Uh, scenario number one is where a company A has acquired a company B. The plan is to shut down the systems of company B and migrate everything across to company A and then continue with the system survey. During analysis, it was found that company B uses Salesforce, but Salesforce is not an approved product in company A. So when I migrate data from Salesforce, where do I migrate to? Well, I don't know. How do you approach them? Any thoughts? Anybody who has faced a similar problem? How do you approach this problem? Well, solutions can be many. And I, I would not say this is right or that is wrong. But how do you approach when you are faced with the problems? Anyone has any thoughts here? No thoughts? Would you start with a equivalent replacement of Salesforce? Like let's say MS Dynamics? Or would you start with something which is more focused on the core business? What would be ideal? Any thoughts here? What are all the approved? Sorry, go ahead. What are all the approved uh, product and company? I would like to know that one first and how widely it has been uh, accepted in the company A uh, and see that how. Why did they used? 
depending okay. upon that sure, depending fine. upon how the, like is the come sometimes it's good to analyze if is company a is also looking to move to any other product or something so need to understand the status of the company a as well so I think if you talk, remember one of the concepts I told you where we talked about architect focusing on the quality and relying on the functional areas coming from business. So I think the first question that you should think is why Salesforce, right? What are the various things that company B does using Salesforce? Is it using the marketing cloud to market? Is it using Salesforce as a CRM? Is it using Salesforce as, you know, maybe a customer support team, right? understand what they are doing, right? Once that understanding is there, then the set of questions that you asked, what are the various products in company? What are the various options I have in company? Those come in, right? If you try to compare Salesforce and then say, oh, this is a replacement, you are not doing a business replacement, you are doing a product replacement. And in such cases, you are losing the ability of clearing out any kind of tech debt you might have. Now, Salesforce has been in company B for some time. I'm sure there'll be a lot of tech debt why incur the tech debt in my new application? So when you have such problems, start with the core thing that business is there, right? We always talk about IT and business as two separate entities, but IT is there to support and service business uh, business entities. So start with why Salesforce? What are the various nuances or business functionality that happens in Salesforce? Think whether they are required or not. Think whether business really wants it in the new world or not. And then see what is the approved software and then back to that. That should be the approach. That should be the set of sequences that you should follow for this problem. Okay. Makes sense. Clear? Awesome. Yeah, Ashita has written a comment. If you can sure. have a look. Can you read it out? I yeah, I would so. say, Ashita, if you are available to speak up yeah, feel free. yeah, yeah. I, th I think while i was writing it down uh, 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 you were already speaking um but you probably took it to said two or three more um uh, you know more points in between or actions sure. that we should be but you're you're absolutely spot on a we need to understand this uh the the organizational system in this case uh, company a which took over company b uh, but also at the same time, it's about the people or the business area that uh, that uh, that was um, using that particular process. So if we product, were, exactly. if we are change, if the product, right? So if we are, we should not just be, you know, yes, the com the new company doesn't have Salesforce as an approved um, uh, product, but product. that does not mm -hmm. mean that we took the downward approach of first choosing exactly. the tool and do it, right? Like we should exactly. be in a position, architect should be in a position to challenge the status quo. That's where, so I think over Very here, good. you have to take an enterprise view as well, right? So an enterprise right. starts with user product, the user, business, and right? then the the user customer. and the business, exactly. And Absolutely. then I was just thinking about that, um, whole thing around uh, where you uh, definitely mentioned uh, that value stream mapping and customer journey mapping are not the same. So maybe there's this opportunity of going down that path. Exactly. Like clearly, exactly. this clearly you got, got to do value stream mapping. But again, we're talking about people and business who would be ending up doing right. using the tool, right? You're not changing exactly. the, the 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 company. Still, you're still only you're still getting those people over. So um, certainly, you you got to do that work first um, before going tool is the last part you need to be considering exactly. about and, if, if, exactly. and even even if it means that if the selection is that you have to have salesforce so be it maybe right like maybe. i don't know exactly. that's <laughs> yeah. not the call you need to take on day one that's the that's, outcome of a lot of decisions that you take from correct. day one to whatever your initial days are Exactly. And then there's always we fight about what and what not, right? What, like those are where those exactly. are where, uh, and that would end up being those trade-off decisions, which will, which is which is pain which, which is painful, but that should be still the last bit. That is the last bit, absolutely. And in fact, it does not happen because in my experience, I've seen this happen a lot. And every time, the first thing that people will say is, "Let's look for replacement." Well, yeah, replacement would come, exactly. but let's see what this does. And do we really need to do all that? And if not. Yeah, let's go for it. Yes. And, so that's, and that's one, something which I wanted. I Sorry, think one more thing I would just like to um, uh, add 
uh, a big part of all of this and the main part i think is the attitude right so i think when yes. when i talk to architects one thing that i yeah. one thing i really uh, really want to focus that you know lean or agile with a small a is what you really need to have like you know and the other thing is as an architect you definitely definitely have to be tool agnostic right Fantastic. like you know Absolutely. that may, because that creates it creates a bias like whenever we have you know starting off in our career we will think so if anything architecture we actually what we imply is more solution architecture solution, or solution yes. design, exactly. designing and so exactly. we all give all the examples that we ever refer to are on tools right so yeah, which yes. which i think is wrong which is where we don't exactly. want our world that is where world we should not right so Thank i mean you, sorry, i took a lot of time point. to talk yeah no no it's fine it's, i think you raised a great point and i was about to talk on that it all boils down to one word and that is called the mindset right if the architect has the mindset to understand the change that is happening understand how the business is changing and what they want it to be i think that's where you are going to take your company and you should be a good architect so so mindset is really critical for an architect to go from the old traditional ways to the new agile ways Okay, I have one more scenario before I complete. Um, you are a solutions architect for a large organization that is undergoing cloud transformation. Business has asked you to provide an estimate for the cost involved in doing the migration. And it's only the cloud cost, the storage cost, the other application cost. We don't have to worry about that now. What are the various factors that you would consider for this? Is the question clear? I'm moving on to a cloud, let's say AWS. How much do I have to pay AWS for the storage, right? The data moving and residing on the AWS service. Application and other things, that's not required at this time. So what are the various things you will, you will think about to calculate this number? Anyone? The current data volume, which is existing. Okay. Current volume, anything else? And how it's scaling up, like what's last quarter, how was so it scaling so that growth. we can prediction? Yep. Volume and growth, absolutely. What else? One could be, uh, you know, how data is being used, like inflow, outflow, in case we are okay. using, you know, a lot of data migration movement is happening, that would incur a lot of costs. And a little no, bit no, around. Not, don't have to worry. It's about the cost only. So migration cost is, is separate. I mean, for this exercise, you don't need to factor it. Oh, no, what I meant, what was, you know, once data is stored, the, what do you do with the data? For example, if you move a lot of data to BI location, that's export of data. From location. So that's a good point. This is about also usage of around... the data. Sorry, go ahead. So, sorry, I'm talking over you. Sir. Yeah. I was, I think a little bit around security as well. Sometimes I often skip security, especially if you're no, working uh, at, yeah. Those are there. Uh, it's all. The question here is only about the cost of storage. Security, yes, is a big factor, authentication and multi tiered but we're not going to worry about that for this question. What else do you need to keep in mind? So I was thinking from an angle that security does add to the cost sometimes. No, no, it will add, it will add. Uh, but again, I'm talking purely storage. My question is only on cloud storage. Security has got, because if you want to create multi tier and all the AWS related security, interfacing with your own companies yes that is a cost you pay for the services that is separate my question is only the storage cost how much data 5 gb of data or 10 gb of data that's it so one uh, we talked about the area and second i think uh, akhilesh mentioned is on the business side you do a lot of reporting so you have to have a replica of the data bi storage and all of that so yes that adds to the cost is uh, I don't have much understanding of cloud, but what I understand is cloud pro provides different solutions for storages, depending upon whether you want to access it frequently. Perfect. Or it needs to Perfect. Be. Great point. I was waiting for that answer to come. The answers that you have given till now are more technology focused, data analytics, reporting, and all of that. Right? There are some data which are accessed once in the six months. There are some data that are accessed every day. And the users are accessing it on their mobiles if they want it right away. Uh, there are some data that are accessed from home Wi-Fi, so good quality, high quality images. There are some data that are accessed from the mobile hotspots or people traveling. So they need compressed, low quality, but faster access, right? Thinking of from a business user standpoint, who are my customers? 
and how are they going to leverage the data? The moment you start thinking, the question that Achilles mentioned comes in, can I, do I need to hear a high cost solution or do I need to use a low cost solution? Right? All those things will come in. And based on that, even though I'm going to store, let's say 10 gigabytes of data, I can say that only one gigabyte needs to be on the faster axis. The remaining nine can go to the slower axis, right? So the question should be answered or looked at from two factors. One is technology, one is business. Business means how are my users going to use the data? And based on that, you decide cheap or fast means of storage and can be stored. So the intent of asking this question was when you are facing a problem, uh, typically, technology people have a mindset of solving problems from a technology side, right? Looking at the technology aspect of it. As an architect, you also need to look at the business side of things. How are the users using it? What is the value my user gets from it? If I do this, how does it save in terms of revenue? How does it save in terms of cost? Or how does it add more revenue? Those are the points you need to keep in mind when coming up with these solutions. So that, that's why I had put this question and thank you for uh, bringing that point up. That's exactly what I wanted you to bring up. So with that, uh, I complete what I wanted to share with you. Uh, so basically the key principles that I would take away from this session, uh, delay the design decisions to as long as possible until it's absolutely necessary. And always architect for change to enable interoperability. The key methods that we see from you know, various frameworks like SAFE, uh, create an hard runway and then build solutions on top of it and always try to manage products not projects. So with that, I complete uh, my presentation. Thank you for your time and listening in. Uh, I know we are almost out of time, but if there are any questions, I can take. Satya, that was phenomenal. I can vouch for the participants. I would love for them to stay back a couple of minutes if you'd like to share your feedback because uh, that kind of chat messages we have been getting in the participation, and I learned quite a lot as well. So thanks a lot, Satya. Uh, uh, by the way, guys, if you can switch on your camera for just a couple of, just one minute, I would love to take a snapshot as I put this in LinkedIn. I know that a few people have already left. If that's okay, that would be great as well. So give me a Excellent. minute. Excellent. All right. Uh, I have my cat behind me. <laughs> <laughs> That's always Absolutely good. Right. That's always good. He came All right. To join. <laughs> Say cheese, everybody. Fantastic. Once again, thanks a lot for everybody joining us and Satya, this was really, uh, what Akhilesh was mentioning, we definitely need a follow-up session. I was like, now I have a tool to ask you, look, people have been asking for follow-up so that <laughs> I can do that. But thank you, no, thank you very much. It's a good thing for me to plan for something on top of what happened. <laughs> so absolutely looking forward. Uh, but opening up, any other questions before we kind of wrap up the session? Um, uh, no, Shakti, I think the question uh, which I started with, um, sort mm -hmm. of addressed with the presentation, uh, uh, one thing, a good takeaway for a key takeaway for me is to, you know, look at the systems from the end point of view, actually, the user Absolutely. point of view, which is a nice way to start with, actually. It helps a lot of things. Second thing, which I had a question was about, you know, how do I uh, address the key quality attributes upfront and, you know, delay uh, on answering rest of the things. And that also got addressed when Satya mentioned about in the product view, where he talked about user business and technology aspects. That's one aspect. And then, you know, we address the key quality attributes. Cloud definitely helps a lot because then we can, you know, leave certain things out that can be addressed later. And so I think I've got a good picture. And third thing he talked about where architecture keeps moving. That's a nice way. That's Lovely. how business actually, yeah, business actually runs. It's not a stagnant thing. So, and we are so attached to the, the history that you don't don't want to leave that. So it was really <laughs> Satya, thank you. Yeah. Uh, and so Akesh, yeah, thanks a lot for the contribution. And with that, we are closing it out. So thanks a lot, everybody, for joining. Have a thank great you. evening, even though it was a thank little you. late because Satya is joining thank from you. India. But thank you, thank you very much. See you all. Have a good day. Take care. Yeah, good have evening. a good day. Bye bye. bye, -bye.